My camera's haunted. I just turned it on to preview it and it starts taking pictures of me. I am, in this video, playing with grammar. So I guess I have to start filming. Hi folks, welcome back. In this video, I'm gonna be talking about all the books I read in November. I have a lot of notes. We'll see if that makes editing this easier because I average around like two hours of footage when I do my wrap ups. So last month I attempted to read 14 books. I DNF'd two. Four of them I owned technically. Ten were from my library and of that ten, three were audiobooks. And as always, I will have a list of all the books I talk about in the description box below. The first book I finished in November was The New Jim Crow. Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander. Uh, so this was an audiobook borrowed from my library. Um, the author is a former litigator, which lends to their credibility. Um, so this is a very thorough argument that America has not eliminated the racial caste system. It has merely been redesigned and is now upheld by our criminal justice system and mass incarceration. Uh, so this book is about 10 years old. There's a very long introduction. There's a, a new preface to the 10th anniversary edition. That new introduction kind of acknowledges what has changed, what hasn't. Um, and then there's like the actual introduction. So there's like an hour <laughs> of audio before we actually get into the book. In terms of like books you should read about racial justice, this is not a beginner book. It's very data heavy, um, but it it, uh, it makes the compelling case that regardless of intent, the results are racially targeted when we look at policing and the justice system and mass incarceration and who's arrested, who's convicted, who's in jail, and who's in jail for short sentences versus long sentences. Like, the, the book is, is really um, illuminating of how deep the systemic policies precedents and incentives go in our system like when we talk about like sy systemic racism like it's a fucking iceberg like what we see and can recognize on the surface and then this book is just like an example of like how deep the barriers are that we have to overcome like they, they there's a lot of discussion about the policies of the war on drugs the military the militarization of police the unbalance in our justice system and like the legal precedents that have been set at every level of our courts. But I think it's really well researched. I think the the examples and the anecdotes give a really clear picture of like how many innocent people get caught up into this system. It's It seems really disheartening, but it's really, really interesting. Um, so, so anyway, at the beginning I mentioned that this is not like a beginner book if you are someone who is or you know someone who is just starting to kind of learn more about um mass incarceration and policing and the ways that it affects um black people in america and people of color um so i would recommend if they're really starting out um I would recommend the documentary 13th. It's long, it's heavy, um, but it's also like, you know, where whereas the audiobook for The New Jim Crow was like 17 hours, that documentary is like, what, like two hours? I don't actually remember, but it's like, you're gonna get like a summary of all the things in a condensed amount of time. Um, also, the New York Times podcast 1619 is, um, like a history of slavery in America and the way that black people continue to be criminalized. Um, and then also the Pod Save the People episode, What Science Says About Police. It's from June 19th, 2020. I mean, Pod Save the People in general is a great podcast, but that, um, that, that episode in particular is really interesting just looking at like data about police and their behaviors and violence and I think the fact that I had like a groundwork of a lot of this knowledge helped me to absorb the mountain of data a little bit better because some of it wasn't new and I was able to now kind of like refine the details and the examples present in my brain. Um, anyway, it's great. 
the next book I read was The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin. So this book is comprised of two personal letters. The first one, first one is addressed to Baldwin's nephew and the second is more of a longer essay. Um, it's part memoir reflection on Baldwin's early life in Harlem and part reflection on racism in America. Holy shit, Baldwin is a beautiful writer. I'm not always one who, like I appreciate beautiful writing, but depending on the style, it's kind of hit or miss for me whether that makes like an author an auto read for me. And I think the way that Baldwin writes is like, this, this he, like, his entire canon of work is going to go onto my 2B red shelf. Am I going to read it all immediately? I don't know, but like, it's beautiful. There is just like so much soul in his writing and he has like an almost clairvoyant ability to translate emotions into words. And maybe that's the thing that really appeals to me is I am someone who really struggles to put abstract emotional concepts into words. And then he does it with like, just such clarity and conciseness and completeness. So some of the insights that he has in this book are still painfully relevant today. Um, it's like you can just pull a quote and you can apply it to current events. Two examples I have are, so like the recent white people response to protests and unrest and looting. So Baldwin says, the real reason that nonviolence is considered to be a virtue in Negroes, I am not speaking now of its racial value, that's another matter altogether, is that white men do not want their lives, their self-image, or their property threatened. Yep. Um, and then, you know, in some ways he's predicted the crisis of mass incarceration that we face now. He says, And there is a limit to the number of people any government can put in prison, and a rigid limit indeed to the practicality of such a course. A bill is coming in that I fear America is not prepared to pay. His writing is beautiful. His, his insights have so much clarity. I really look forward to reading more of him in the future. The next book I read is one I had a physical copy of. This is Love Beyond Body, Space, and Time, an indigenous LGBT sci-fi anthology. So this is one of the books I read for Indigathon. I will have um, my TBR and uh, Indigathon tag video linked in the description box below if you would like to check that out. Um, so I read this for the Indigathon prompt of intersectionality. This is an anthology of speculative and science fiction short stories and poems, and maybe just one poem. So this collection was lovely and it was really creative in the various ways that queerness was represented in these stories. Like some of them are just really wholesome love stories. Some of them have more emphasis on indigenous identity and experiences. I think my favorite story was Imposter Syndrome by Mari Kurisato which is a really interesting analogy about the concept of passing in a trans body. I think if you have a different interpretation, I would love to hear it. I wish I could speak more in depth about this collection, but I've realized that short stories are not really my favorite genre just because I struggle to remember the impression that they made on, on me because they're short and I have a memory like a goldfish. Um, I don't get to spend a lot of time with the story before my brain is trying to absorb a new cast of characters and a new writing style. Um, but, uh, from the beginning to the end of last month, uh, I, it's, I've definitely gotten a lot better at taking notes about what I'm reading. Um, so if that keeps up, um, I look forward to like re maybe reading this again in the future and being able to actually keep better track of my thoughts and being able to give a more specific review. But for the meantime, I'm like, it's great. I'm glad I picked it up. Um, I think it's a great introduction to... A lot of indigenous writers. Next book I read is Six of Crows by Leigh Bardugo. I picked this up because as I am watching people's YouTube videos from the past, this is a book that a lot of people mention. This is an author that lots of people keep mentioning. So I'm like, all right, if I'm gonna be on booktube, this feels like an author that I need to have some frame of reference of. Uh, so this is a magical prison heist story that's heavily influenced by Dutch and Nordic culture. The title comes from the six characters that orchestrate the heist, later described as a gambler, a convict, a wayward son, a lost Grisha, a Suli girl who has become a killer, a boy from the barrel who has become something worse. 
So the magic in this world is present in the Grisha. These are people who practice the small sciences. Um, their powers allow them to subtly alter reality on like an atomic and molecular level in a specialized area, and it makes them very efficient healers, engineers, alchemists, soldiers, etc. In some parts of the world, they are hunted as abominations, and um, some of our characters are refugees from those conflicts. The prison heist is prompted by large political influences reacting to the emergence of a dangerous new drug that can heighten Grisha abilities to a catastrophic, godlike level, but also leaves the Grisha heavily addicted and easy to control by anyone who can provide them with the drug. Um, this is definitely a character-driven story. Everybody has a mysterious background that we slowly learn about as the events unfold. Loyalties are uneven. I was constantly guessing as to whether certain characters would forgive or come clean or turn on each other. Um, there's a lot of interesting exploration about why certain cult cultures fear the Grisha to the point of wanting to exterminate them. Like, we clearly understand that pursuing genocide against the people is wrong, but I think we're also given substantial doubt as to whether the world is better or safer with their existence. Interesting. Um, the ending is like this tense, broken, tentative cliffhanger, and it leaves me really curious about where the story is going to go from here. Um, also, interesting. Um, the chronic pain that the character Kaz endures from an old injury is inspired by the author's chronic illness. So if you're looking for some authentic disability rep that's simply a part of the fabric of the general world building, here you go. Next book I picked up was the audiobook of Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Uh, this is the same author that wrote The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, which I reviewed in my wrap up for last month. So this is an interview style history of the fictional popular 70s band The Six and also the rise of the singer Daisy Jones and her time as a collaborative artist with The Six. It deals a lot with addiction and the destructive lifestyles that can come with success and fame um, and also the way that collaborative creativity can be messy and dramatic but also really fulfilling. I thought that like the perspective on addiction and getting clean, staying clean, hitting rock bottom, I thought that there was like a really well-rounded perspective of different characters' experience with that. There was definitely one character where I'm like, are you going to relapse? Are you going to relapse? What What's going to push you over the edge? And it's really interesting to like see like the moments of weakness and the moments of strength in that character. So I personally love the way that the story deals with conflicting perspectives. When I first heard about the way the story was described, I thought it was like one chapter of an, of an event from one person's perspective and then another chapter with a new person's perspective kind of talking about that event from the beginning all over again. But because of like the interview script style, we're getting everyone's perspective like at the same time. Um, so it's, and it's really interesting to see how different personalities will react to the same situation or event or like the frustrating ways that small communication missteps can add up. So again, like I listened to this on audiobook and I feel like that is exactly how this story should be consumed. I have no desire to read this as a book. Um, I think the full cast audio was really well cast and I think it helped me really get to know the characters better and keep the story flowing so much better rather than reading each line like a script. Um, also, thank you, author, for including perspectives from the audio engineer and the roadie that travel with the band. Shout out to the technicians that are the blood and bones of artistic productions. I hope we can all get back to work soon. I really enjoyed this book. I think I have more of a personal connection to the story of Evelyn Hugo. I like that book a little bit better, but this one was also great and um, a really, a really great um, audiobook experience. Next book I picked up that I have already teased, It's a Lazoe by Darcy Little Badger. Um, I read this for the Indigathon prompt of new to you author. Technically, <laughs> see the TBR video for why, why I say technically. Um, so this follows our character Elatsoe, Ellie for short. She is a Lipan Apache teenager in an alternative magical America. She can raise the ghosts of dead animals. Fairies, vampires, and psychics are real, but everything else is pretty much the same. Also, it's illustrated by Ravina Kai, who has beautiful 
illustrations throughout um, the various chapter headings of the book. So um, the story is that Ellie's cousin is killed in a car crash and he visits her in a dream to tell her that he was actually murdered and he tells her who the killer is. So now it's up to Ellie, her best friend Jay, and her family to find out not only what happened but to actually prove it. Um, first off, I absolutely love that Ellie's parents are so supportive of her. I feel like in YA we so often see adults dismissing the theories and revelations from children and this was just like a wonderful about face of parents not only believing Ellie but helping her stay safe as she investigates and doing what parents are supposed to do by teaching her how to navigate the difficult situations that life throws at you. So great. Um, I had a really interesting revelation when I was thinking about Ellie's character. Initially I was describing her as happy and I quickly and I quickly realized that that description is bullshit. Her cousin's been murdered, so, and she knows that his death is not going to be properly investigated because white people will do anything to protect their comfort. And she's very aware of the traumatic history of her people in this country. Um, so I think what I was picking up on is this strange expectation for stories of marginalized people to have an element of performative trauma. Um, I'm so used to seeing characters have to live through harrowing experience, deal with PTSD or other difficult emotional and relational fallout, or at best be like bitter, untrustworthy, or detached. And then here's Ellie, who is this bright, whole, empowered, determined young woman. And this is what is so important about Own Voices literature. This book is written for people who don't need the concept of generational trauma explained to them. They don't need to be convinced that the stakes are high and they can relate to the story without having to be triggered by it. The themes of this book have a lot of complex layers and relate to the ways in which genocide is not yet past tense for indigenous American people. The scene with the vampire chasing the car is when it finally clicked for me that this book is not fucking around. That's such a great scene. <laughs> um, the native people of this land are still here and there's a lot of power in that knowledge and in that reality. Um, and when we are, when we finally get to the end of the mystery and the revelation of the cause of her cousin's murder, it's a chilling reminder of the ways that people in power often maintain their power at the literal cost of other human bodies and their well-being, and they will tie their logic into knots, justifying the harm that they cause. Um, also, if you pick up a physical copy of this book, pay close attention to the illustrations at the beginning of each chapter because they tell their own story. The next song I picked up was The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. This is another, I think, like, booktube, bookstagram favorite that I felt like, I, all right, oh, this is like a lot of people's, like, favorite book of all time or something, so I better look into it. Um, <laughs> so this is a queer romance focused on the retelling of the story of Achilles, the fabled warrior of the Battle of Troy, and his relationship with his childhood companion, Patroclus. I'm only somewhat familiar with the story, but I have it on authority from a good friend of mine who is intimately familiar with the story of the Iliad. It's his favorite story of all time. Um, so he hasn't finished the book, but what he read, he could already tell that this author really knows her stuff in terms of understanding classical ancient Greece and their mythology. And it was in a conversation with this friend that helped me realize like what's so compelling about this story, especially for me. Um, in my opinion, it doesn't matter specifically that the story is about Achilles. I, for me, he's interchangeable with any hyper-masculine famous historical or mythical figure. Maybe there's something about Achilles specifically that's significant, but I don't have the right context to really be able to tell you what that is. So what is important is that this book is a stunning example of the trend of rewriting famous stories or historical events to contain queer characters when the originals technically did not. And I believe that this is happening because our stories have been erased, so we've had to create our own. Um, we know, we as a society, know that there have always been queer people, whether they've been gay or trans or otherwise non-conforming to heteronormativity, but those stories have literally been cut out of, out of the history that has been passed down to us. 
Um, so like the last 20% of this book shows us a really beautiful and tragic imagining of the way that that happens, the way that those with power choose to preserve a story and they choose to edit it, and the way that those who know the truth just will let it happen. It's beautifully written, the setting descriptions are really vivid. Um, from my limited memory, there are a few moments where the author chooses to tweak the details of certain events, and those changes I think are really purposeful in building these characters and their relationships. So I don't know if it's my favorite of all time, but I definitely see the hype. I'm, I'm so glad that I made the decision to pick it up because it was a great experience. The next book I read was Heartbeat Braves by Pamela Sanderson. This was the group read for Indigifon. Uh, this is an own voices indigenous romance that centers around the Crooked Rock Urban Indian Center. Rayanne is hard at work planning an arts festival to celebrate the center's move to a new space when her work is suddenly handed over to the inexperienced and attractive Henry Grant. Henry is put in this position by his well-meaning but forceful uncle, uncle, who is the board president of the community center. I loved all the characters. I really like the dynamic between Rain and Henry. As much as Henry is drawn into this work unwillingly and doesn't know what the fuck he's doing or even what the center really does at first, he understands that the work is really important to Rayanne and to the community that they serve. And he's determined to not be a dead weight, and he is very respectful of the work and expertise that already that Rayan has already put into this project. Even if initially he doesn't plan on sticking around for long, he is admirably committed during the time that he's there. And Rayan rightfully has her period of time where she's insulted and frustrated, but she does see that Henry is trying to make the best of a bad situation, and he's really not the bad guy here. So they work together to serve a higher purpose, and sparks fly in the process. It was a good time. And I know I'm not the only one who feels this, but I feel like what I loved most about this book was like learning about the work of the community center and um, and like their specific struggles as a nonprofit. Like I also work in the nonprofit sector, and while I'm not involved in fundraising or project planning, I do understand the conflict of we need money to do our work but they won't give us money until we demonstrate we can do the work. <laughs> um, I've also seen the dynamic of having to cater to board members and donors that your organization depends on, even if their demands seem to interfere with the best method, best method for you to do your work. I loved hearing about the work that this community center was doing, serving the specific needs of Native American people living in cities far away from reservations. Um, and the unique challenges of trying to do that work far away from the strongest center of your cultural support. Um, there are a couple of uh, escalating crises that keep the stakes high, but all of the employees of the center are so competent and so dedicated, and it was really rewarding to see how they problem solved and persevered. Um, and then we've already gotten like some teasers of the different romance dynamics that are going to be in the subsequent books, so this is definitely a series that I am interested in continuing to read. Um, it's a good time. The next book I picked up was Melting Stones by Tamara Pierce. So um, even though I have a physical copy, uh, I listened to this on audiobook. This was and it was borrowed from my library. Also like this is a different cover from the, a lot of the ones that I keep seeing. Um, can you see this thing? This is the character of Lubo. Luvo. We will talk about him in a moment. So uh, this story centers around Evumeme, Evie for sure, a very powerful 14-year-old stone mage. She's a former street orphan, and this book takes place after she has survived a brutal war during which she was tortured and also lost all of her pet cats that she had traveled with since she was adopted by the mages of Winding Circle. So um, Evie is accompanied by Rose Thorn, a master mage of the Winding Circle Temple, and her power deals with plants and all things growing. So they are sent to one of the small Emelon Islands to investigate strange reports of plants dying and water being poisoned. So this audiobook was produced by Fullcast Audio, and the story was released as an audiobook like a full year before the print book came out. The story goes that Tamara Pierce was so enamored by the voice actress for Evie in the audiobook for Street Magic that she wrote the story with her narration in mind. Um, and then also the character of Lugo, Luvo, the walking, talking heart of a mountain, was excellent. Like, perfect 
perfect gravitas. <laughs> um, so like all of Pierce's books, this story is so well researched. If you've been caught up in the current trend of learning about crystals, this book is for you. Um, Evie can travel beyond her body as a pure magical being and she explores the mystery of the island through the layers of stone and minerals on the island and we learn a lot about like this crystal is for this kind of thing and this rock does this kind of thing and this one's formed in a volcano and it's it's the funnest geology lesson I've ever had. <laughs> so there are recurring themes of adults underestimating and disrespecting Evie because of her youth and thankfully characters like Rose Thorne not only intervene but drive home the point that her age does not diminish the trauma that she has gone through or the extent of her power. Um, while I do think these instances can get a little bit repetitive, I do understand that this is a common theme in Pierce's work aimed at younger readers. This, this sympathy and understanding the struggles of trying to find your own voice and your own self-respect when everyone around you automatically talks down to you. Um, I think it's one of the things that made me love her books in the first place, and, and I've seen repeated criticisms that Evie's character was too annoying and unlikable, and yeah, in a lot of ways she is, com especially compared to some of the other characters in Pierce's work. She's impatient, she's stubborn, she's untrusting, and, but like, she's supposed to be. Her personality is heavily influenced by rock magic, so of course she's going to be hard-headed, single-minded, and stubborn. Um, there's a conflict late in the book caused by Evie's temper and refusal to be gentle, and Rose Thorne comments that in the years that she was supposed to be learning to be with people, she was scrabbling to survive all alone. Um, and Evie's major character development is learning that she doesn't actually have anything to, to gain by trying to distance herself from people, and despite her ethereal rock magic, she's a human being in a human body, and the best way that she can combat the cruelness of the world is through human connection. Keep in mind that this character is 14, and that means this is aimed at, like, the younger half of YA readers, and that just means, like, a different kind of writing style and a different kind of character development than, you know, a book aimed at a 17-year-old. Um, I still really enjoyed it. I love... I love the magic systems that Tamora Pierce has created, um, and it was a good time. <laughs> Alright, uh, the next book that I finished was one that it took me forever to get through because so many library books kept being available, so it just took me a while to get through it, but um, I enjoyed it so much. This is Watership Down by Richard Adams. This is my ancient copy with red sprayed edges. I think my grandparents gave this to me when I was definitely way too young to appreciate this book. Um, so in the story, a group of rabbits depart from their home warren after the prophetic fiver foresees impending destruction at the hands of men. Led by the small but clever Hazel, they journey many dangerous miles until they find the idyllic location of Watership Down, but even there, their challenges are not over. This is a fascinating book. Um, it's about rabbits, actual wild rabbits, not the anthropomorphic humanized characters we know from books like Redwall or Wind in the Willows. Um, but these rabbits also have like their own language, their own traditions, their own mythology. We get repeated chapters that are just the telling of, you know, Ella Reira, who is like their mythical rabbit hero. Um, and the story does an excellent job of presenting the tension that is being a prey animal in the wild. It was so tense. It was also, it was like, I had to like stop reading it before bed because it was just, <sighs> um, like I know this book is famous, but I feel like I don't hear enough about why it's so good. It's such like a detailed, complex, but sensical world. It makes so much sense. Um, it's focused on this epic journey. It's full of adventureness and cleverness and loss. Like I've heard kind of referenced as a children's book and maybe it would suit like older YA readers but I think the true impact of the story would be lost on children. So for most of the book we follow only male rabbits so I have the nagging question of 
where are the does? <laughs> um, I was worried that we were going to go the whole book without any significant female characters, but when we get to the last major conflict of the book, um, when the watership rabbits have infiltrated the warren of Ephrafra, we meet the character of Heisenthle, and she is such a redeeming character. When the large rabbit bigwig discusses his escape plan to her, there's this brief but significant description. Bigwig realized he had stumbled quite unexpectedly upon what he needed most of all, a strong, sensible friend who would think of her own account and help to bear his burden. Great. I don't know if I would call this one of my favorite books of all time. There's just a lot about the genre and the format that just kind of aren't my thing. But it's definitely one of like my best surprise reads of the year. This is a book I'd read when I was like 11 or 12. Couldn't remember anything about it. I didn't think I was really going to love it, but at the end I was like, oh, the fame is well earned. Um, it's great. Like, I might be ambitious in trying to compare this, like, epic journey to, like, Lord of the Rings, but then, like, the, but it has, like, this very simple little premise of it's just wild rabbits in the British countryside, but it works. What a delight. The next book I read was Full Moon by Jim Butcher. This is book two in the Dresden File series. So in this story, it has been about a month since the last time wizard Harry Dresden has had any work consulting with the Chicago PD. He also hasn't heard anything from his friend slash contact at the Special Investigations Unit, Karen Murphy. So he suspects that there are still unresolved issues from the events of their last big case together. Karen suddenly shows up and pulls Harry into a gruesome investigation that has all the elements straight out of a werewolf horror movie. In my review of the first book of the series, I brought up some concerns with the way that the author wrote about women. I would say the worst moment in this book is a scene where a female character decides to dance naked in the street to distract a surveillance unit. But then when she gets back into the car and Harry questions how she knew that that would work, she says, of course it worked. Men are foolish. They will stare at anything female and naked. <laughs> okay, um, I appreciate the self-deprecating self-acknowledgement. Um, and compared to what we saw in the last book, which was a description of how beautiful a woman's body was in the same paragraph that described her being eviscerated, I'm gonna call that scene in this book a slight improvement. It's definitely not great, but I, I definitely see the author trying to write strong, complex female characters. They just also need to be attractive. <sighs> anyway, as far as good things, there was a surprising dive into Harry's mind where he confronts his subconscious self and has a pretty good conversation about his mental health and relationships with people in his life. There's a pattern where this character, because of his out-of-date and chauvinistic attitudes towards women, um, but because of that, he always wants to protect women um, and protect the women in his life. And up until now, that has usually manifested in keeping secrets from them about the realities of magic in the world. But his subconscious convinces him that this is actually puts them in more danger. Harry can't fight the forces of darkness alone. He's going to need help. He's going to need to actually trust the people that he calls his friends. And that is also going to mean that he sometimes puts them in danger. So he needs to actually help them be prepared for what he's coming. Um, it's a line about, like, you need to stop playing shepherd and start playing coach. Um, which I thought was a really, a really interesting and like very satisfying bit of character development in what is just like a fun time pulpy action series. Um, anyway, but like this, but also like overall, this book is just so much fun. There's a quote at one point that is literally, sometimes being able to use magic was just so cool. And yeah, like, that's that's the appeal of the whole series. If you could use magic in modern times, what cool stuff would you come up with? It's a fun time. It's a palate cleanser book. I'm, I'm going to be continuing to borrow the series from my library. Um, so the next couple of books I picked up are classified as erotic fiction. Let's get awkward. So anyway, I, I debated for a while about whether I wanted to talk about these books. Um, 
So I'll just kind of briefly go into the reasons for why I decided to just fucking go for it. Um, one, I am an adult. I set my video settings to not appropriate for children, so presumably so are you. At this rate, my channel is a decade out from getting monetized, so fuck it, I'm gonna talk about whatever the fuck I want. <laughs> um, also, like, romance and erotic novels are a significant industry. There are entire publishing houses dedicated to these books, and I think, like, a lot of the stigma around those genres are based on outdated prudishness and sexism, so let's get over it. Um, and also, depending on personal preference, um, they're a good time. It's really hard to read one of these books and be in a bad mood, provided you get a premise that works for you. That's super important. Um, I also, like, had this realization that, um... For a lot of people, these novels might provide the sex ed that they never got in school, so let's celebrate the ones that promote healthy relationships, consent, boundaries, and accurate information about our bodies, and let's call out the ones that promote relationships with abusive behavior, power imbalance, and misinformation. You know, if there are things like that in the books that you like, cool, but I want you to have the information to be able to identify when this is fine in a fantasy, but not in real life. Um, cool. Um, so, the first one I picked up after browsing, I don't know, maybe 20 different... I probably clicked into the summary of like 20 different books before I found one that like felt like it had the right kind of attitude towards the content in the book. So this first one I picked up was Crash Into You by Ronnie Lauren. This is the first book, first book in the Loving on the Edge series. So um, in this story, Bryn Lebrecht has to go undercover as a sexual submissive at an exclusive BDSM club to find her missing sister. Um, she's also working to overcome past sexual trauma um, family trauma, failed relationships, and on top of that, the Dom who ends up claiming her is her ex-boyfriend, Reed Jameson. Uh, so in this book, trigger warnings for sexual assault, murder of a parent, kidnapping, descriptions of panic attacks, and disparaging comments towards sex workers. There's a lot going on in the story. So, like, as I just kind of indicated in the trigger warnings, this is not gonna be <laughs> the Sexy Fontaine book for everybody. Um, the sexual assault of our female lead is never described on page, but we do see the moments leading up to it, and there are many moments of her having flashbacks and panic reactions um, to situations that trigger her. Um, that being said, a lot of the story is about her overcoming trauma by reteaching her body that sex should be about pleasure, not pain or fear, and that having a partner that you trust is essential. So the larger plot of the story revolves around looking for Bryn's sister and then discovering that her disappearance is related to events that happened during Bryn's past relationship with Reed. It's connected to her mother's death and even reveals the identity of the man that assaulted her. There's jumping back and forth in time that builds the mystery from two directions. Um, and we also get a lot of insight into our characters from jumping between both Bryn and Reed's perspective. Things I didn't love, kind of a short list. Um, there's some behavior on Reed's part that could be considered as unfairly manipulative, but we never see those moments from his narrative. So I think it's believable that there's another interpretation and we just never get to see it. Um, probably maybe the worst moments of this book are the fact that Bryn's mother was a prostitute and her sister is a stripper and there's quite a bit of disparaging language towards sex workers. There's sporadic attempts to demonstrate that a lot of these views are unfair stereotypes, and sometimes those comments are intentionally coming from characters that we're supposed to not like. But I don't think overall that that, I think like that's the least balanced perspective in the book. Um, things I liked. Uh, there's a lot of discussion emphasizing that dominance in BDSM relationships are not the same as abuse. Um, there's constant reinforcements on the necessity of trust and communication between the people in that kind of relationship. Um, there are clear moments that demonstrate that the submissive does have a lot of power in this dynamic, um, and this lifestyle only works if both parties are getting something out of it, whether it be physically, psychologically, or both. Um, 
Also, I think the mystery was pretty well done. It kept me guessing and interested throughout most of the book, and I liked how all of the pieces came together. Um, I'm, I have already begun dis discovering more works by this author. Um, in next month, I'm gonna, I, I've already finished the second book in this series, and I will talk about that in my December wrap-up. So the next book I picked up was On Dublin Street by Samantha Young. Uh, I DNF'd this. Wait. Did I DNF something else? I said I DNF two. I was wrong. Um, I only DNF'd one book this month. So I read 13. In this book, we follow Jocelyn Butler as she moves to Edinburgh, Scotland, and moves in with a new roommate and develops angsty, I hate him, but I want him feeling towards her roommate's alpha male, super successful brother. I didn't know if this is at 40%. It's definitely more of a romance, hardly any steamy scenes, which is what I was looking for. I mean, maybe there's more in the later half of the book, but um, 40% is a, is a hefty investment. <laughs> um, also, like, the writing was flat and, like, somewhat has haphazard. I didn't care about the characters. I just didn't care, so I moved on. <sighs> anyway, um, so then the next book I read... Um, was Blush by Opal Carew. Uh, Hannah Lane is recovering from a recent breakup and tries to overcome some personal inhibitions by hooking up with a regular customer at the cafe that she works at, and then is led to believe that he's also enrolled in the Intro to Kama Sutra elective course she had originally planned to take with her ex. Turns out he's actually the instructor, but Hannah doesn't learn that until very late in the story. Oh, and Hannah has never been able to have an orgasm, which is the steamy focus of the story. Well, it's, it starts focusing on that, and then, like, the latter half is exploring fantasies, which is interesting. Um, so also, her ex is hovering at the edge of her life, trying to win her back, and he's also consulting with the instructor of that class. Um, there is a very, like, Comedy of Errors-esque theme of everybody not knowing that they're actually talking to the same people. It's... It's kind of fun, but I could take it or leave it. Um, things I didn't love, the relationship boundaries between Hannah and her ex were very fluid, which is necessary for what happens at the end of the book, but it felt weird for trying to maintain trusting relationships. Um, some of the Kama Sutra stuff was a little, like, woo-woo for my taste, but it's, like, an interesting perspective. Also, the cover design is confusing. There's, like, nothing to do with ice cubes in the story. Things I liked, uh, frank discussions about how pleasure in a woman's body can be complicated and some of the steamy scenes demonstrate some good ideas for overcoming some psychosomatic blocks. Um, there's a lot of good conversation about the utility of sexual fantasies and I like the way it showed that imagining or describing fantasies is a safe way to indulge in the excitement of the scenario that might Otherwise, just be dangerous or physically impossible to have in real life. Um, overall, it was fine, but I think it's, like, ultimately forgettable. I think once the story started delving deeper into the exploring a fantasy plotline, there were just more things that I wasn't personally drawn to. But I can appreciate that the characters had a good time. <laughs> that was my wrap-up. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I will have my other social media places linked in the description if you'd like to connect with me elsewhere. I hope you have a good rest of your day. I encourage you to go out into the world and be curious. I will catch you folks in my next video. Bye!